life isn't about any one philosophy, like minimalism or any ism. It's about being comfortable with change, almost like rebirthing your identity. That has this sort of freeing feeling. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 312. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, James Altucher is back on the show. He's a successful entrepreneur, angel investor, chess master, and prolific writer. He started 20 companies, 17 have failed, but he's learned a lot along the way and is currently invested in over 30. James is the author of 18 books, including the Wall Street Journal bestsellers, The Power of No, and Choose Yourself. His latest book, Reinvent Yourself, was number one in the Amazon store shortly after its release. His blog, jamesaltature.com, has attracted more than 20 million readers since its launch in 2010. James hosts a successful podcast, The James Altucher Show, which has over 30 million downloads. Super impressive. Before we get into the details of what was discussed with James, I'm super excited to share with you about a new product that was launched in collaboration with Chalice Spice, which is a local artisan tea company, and they're also available online. Over the last few weeks, I've been formulating the perfect pregnancy tea for each trimester, and it's designed to soothe pregnancy symptoms and to help support and strengthen your body and baby throughout pregnancy and for delivery. And as you can imagine, it's called the ultimate baby tea. No surprises there, and we'd love for you to get your hands on it. If you're planning on getting pregnant, or if you are pregnant, or even if you aren't pregnant, the herbs in each blend are so balancing and so perfect. So this is super exciting. It's always fun to have a new product, and this is our first edible, consumable product. So if you want to get your hands on it, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com forward slash tub T. That's T-U-B-T-E-A. All right, so let's get into the details of what was discussed with James today. James talks about his experiment with minimalism. He talks about the idea of practicing change, the concepts of money, materialism, and consumerism why you shouldn't read the newspaper or watch the news, why it's important to invest in improving yourself, and why it's always important to focus on what's happening right now. Lots of great things discussed. Excited for you to hear this. Here we go with James Altucher. Hello, James. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I feel so grateful to be invited onto a health podcast. Whenever I look at a health podcast, I always see these people who are ripped or jacked and they're either in their swim trunks or bikinis or whatever. And they look like this goal that I only wish I could aspire to, but I've never really aimed in that direction. Although I do feel in general, very healthy. Health podcast seems to imply a certain thing. And I always feel grateful to go on one. Well, we had a lot of fun last time you're on the show. We got into a lot of good stuff and I know we're going to do the same again today. Excellent. Well, thanks for having me on. And last time we talked, you were actually living in Airbnbs, living a very minimalistic lifestyle. So I know since then your lifestyle has changed and you're living in a permanent location, or at least permanent for the time being. But first, take us back to life in the Airbnb scene and what that environment was like. So just to summarize is that I kind of got overwhelmed with a lot of things going on in my life. And at the same time, my lease was up on not one, but two apartments. I was living a complicated life. And I decided, you know what? I can't deal with this. And I had to go to a California on a trip. I think I was, I don't even know what I was doing. I had to go to California. So I packed up my carry-on bag. I took the bag on the plane. And so it had like two shirts, two pants, a computer, toothbrush. And I asked a friend of mine, throw out everything in both apartments. And in particular, one that I'd lived in for many years. I'm not renewing the lease. And she said, well, what do you want me to do? You want me to put it to storage? And I'm like, no, throw it out. And then I thought about it. And I said, okay, you could do one of four things. You can keep anything you want. You could sell anything you want and keep the money for yourself. You can throw things out or you can give things to charity. And I said, but whatever you do, don't call me. And I thought it would take her like a day. How much stuff could I possibly have? It took her a week with like an 18-wheeler truck and her entire family helping her every day. But the only time she did call me was she said, your diploma's here. You sure you want me to throw that out? You worked hard for that. 
And I'm like, are you kidding? I didn't work hard. I've never looked at that diploma again. Just throw that one in the fireplace. And that was it. When I got home from California on that trip, I had no place to stay. So I just stayed in an Airbnb and I'm like, oh, this is good. Someone else basically provided the apartment, the furniture, the towels, the soaps, the dishes, the furniture. And I just kept doing that for years, just living from Airbnb to Airbnb and never having more belongings than what would fit in my carry-on. And you mentioned years there. How long exactly did this go on for? I guess about three years. It's only recent that I moved into an apartment. There was an area of New York I wanted to live in. I couldn't find an Airbnb because there was all sorts of regulations in New York that were starting up and nobody wanted to deal with it. So in this one area, there was no Airbnbs available. And I called a friend of mine. I'm like, what do I do? And she said to me, you know what? This experiment is over. People, women in particular, are going to think you're creepy. You need to find an apartment, get a table, get dishes, get your own bed, and just live someplace. And so I did. I took her advice and I did it. And actually, I love it. I'm glad I went through the experience I did. Life isn't about any one philosophy, like minimalism or anyism. It's about being comfortable with change and always kind of almost like rebirthing your identity in some way. Like that has this sort of freeing feeling. Keeping things fresh. Yeah, keeping things fresh. And, you know, there's something to be said for rebirth and not being tied to any one script about how you should live your life. And of course, that sounds, for instance, I'm married right now. It's not like I'm saying to myself, well, I'm going to be married for three years and then move on. Like I love my wife. I love my kids. I would never want to change that. But you have to be able to sometimes practice having change in your life so that when unfortunate changes happen or changes that you don't expect happen, you're able to roll with them more easily. And it's not like I try for change. These things just happen. And you flow with it. It makes you less rigid. Yeah, I think it's important to be less rigid. I know somebody who is moving right now and is just very upset about it, very sad. And yet I know somebody else who is a young person who lost their mother recently and had to move. And she was very sad. And they're both equally sad for different reasons, but one seems less reasonable than the other. Although you can't compare, everything is relative. But it just makes me think that change does happen. And sometimes it's sad. Sometimes it's nostalgic. Sometimes it seems good. And in every case, you have to have equanimity to how you deal with it. You have to deal with it without ruffling the waves too much. And you mentioned you're in a new apartment now. And I'm just curious, are you renting or buying? Because I found a blog post on your website that was don't buy a home exclamation mark. So tell us about that. Yeah, I am renting. I would never buy a home. I mean, think about it this way. Let's say I'm just making up numbers. This is New York City, so places are more expensive. Let's say I don't know what the average price of a home in New York City is. I'm just going to make it up. And let's say it's a one bedroom home in New York City is probably a million dollars. For a million dollars, you could probably pay rent of $5,000 a month for a one bedroom home. And that means you pay one two hundredth the amount to live in a million dollar home for a month. Now, yes, you have to pay it again the next month, but so what? I wouldn't want to write a check for a million dollars, nor would I want to put $200,000 down, get $800,000 in debt, and then have to do whatever maintenance, property taxes, mortgage. Like people say, oh, your rent, you're just throwing it down the toilet, but mortgage with interest you know, you're probably paying three times the amount of the house than the million dollars. Probably when you're done paying the mortgage over 30 years, you've probably spent over $3 million. And then when you throw in maintenance and property taxes, you've spent much more. Everyone's like, oh, a home's a good investment. They're always so wrong about that. And I have never actually seen someone sit down and just do the basic math. And the math never works out. It's, it's always better to rent. But by the way, I only say that in the US. Like, I don't want to get into finance here, but there's different strategies in different countries, but buying a home in the U.S. is a bad deal. Is there ever a specific instance when buying a home in the U.S. makes sense? No. Okay. If Right now, if you go to Detroit, now we're kind of veering into finance. Maybe it's all under the same umbrella of health, but when you invest your hard-earned money, like you put in hours and work to make that money that's sitting in your bank account. When you send it out of your bank account for an investment, 
you need to have some sort of unfair advantage. You need to know, for instance, okay, here's a situation in Buffalo, New York. Buffalo's been losing population every 10 years, so housing prices have been gone down. But you happen to know or think or theorize there's going to be a boom in Buffalo. And then furthermore, you look at the tax rolls in New York State and you realize, okay, here's some houses where there's tax liens on the homeowner. So it gives you a reason to believe that you might be able to negotiate a better discount to the the average value of homes in that area. That might be a decent investment. But again, I wouldn't spend the money to live there. I'd rather rent. Now, the downside of renting, this is like the case with my friend who is sad she is moving right now. The downside of renting is that the owner might eventually want to live back in his or her house. That could happen to me. I live in an apartment that I love. I was so happy to move into this apartment after years of Airbnb. But at some point, the owner of this apartment is going to want to move back into his home and I will have to move. But that's the whole idea of practicing change. I know I'll be able to handle it, to be able to move out of this place that I truly love. And I love living here, but I know I'll be happy living anywhere. I've lived everywhere now, so I know I'll be happy. And all those years living in Airbnbs, have you taken any of that minimalistic knowledge and experience and brought it forward into your current living situation? It was interesting. One time I was walking around with my carry-on bag. I always took it with me everywhere. I kind of had this idea that when I left whatever room or Airbnb or apartment I was staying in, that I would leave no footprint behind. No one would be able to walk into that apartment and say, someone's probably staying there. So I always had all my belongings with me. I always used to buy books. So I'd pass the bookstore and I'd be like, oh, that book in the window. First, the cover looks beautiful. I know that author. I probably really love this book. I'm going to go in and buy it. And then I would stop myself and say, you know what? I have this discipline. I am not buying anything unless I throw something out of my carry-on bag. And I would just get it on my phone Kindle app instead, or my computer Kindle app. And that was my discipline. I sort of trained myself to essentially not be a consumer. I never bought anything for myself. And money has nothing to do with it. Being obsessed about money is different than being obsessed with consumerism or materialism. And I really learned the distinction between money and materialism and consumerism. And now, of course, I do buy books. I love buying books. I actually never buy anything on the Kindle now. I love the feel of a paperback book. And I like looking at the cover and I like putting a bookmark in and getting back to it. But so what? It doesn't change my views about consumerism now, which which changed during that three-year period. I'm the same way when it comes to physical books. We read a ton of books preparing for these interviews, and and I read a lot of other things on my own as well. And I've never had a Kindle to compare, but there is something about that tactile sense of cracking into a book. And I like to write in it and highlight it and get it all messy when I'm going through it. Yeah, I agree. I never read the Kindle anymore. I think actually it hurt my eyes when I read on the phone Kindle. Like if I go on a plane, I would just pull out my phone and read on the Kindle. And I think I ended up having stigmatism as a result. I probably should have adjusted the file. I'm not blaming the Kindle, I'm blaming myself. And James, other than the books, have there been any other splurges that you've gotten into and things that you've let yourself buy more so now that you're in a more permanent location? Yeah, I don't do it because I want things. I do it because I want that one thing. And then I say, okay, a book or I want a bookshelf, or I want a bed that's comfortable for me. But then I've also bought higher priced items. I bought a comedy club. So rather than buying like a fancy car or something, it's basically the same amount of money bought me part of a comedy club. And I love comedy. I basically bought myself a thousand experiences. Where does your fascination with comedy come from? I think comedians train themselves to see the truth. Truth is sort of hiding in plain sight. And I think comedy looks for that truth. And most people, they don't have the training to look for that truth. Can I give you a small example? Yes, please. So I just heard a comedian say a funny joke on his Instagram page. He basically said, what about that Willy Wonka movie? Wasn't that a sucky movie? And of course, I'm wondering, why is it? That's one of my favorite all-time movies. Why is he saying that? And then he says, do you really think Charlie could run a factory? Why did Willy Wonka give Charlie a whole factory? He's this white trash kid from Britain. You think he knows how to calculate the margins on chocolate? Oh, let's just give Charlie a factory. 
pointing out the obvious. Right. And he's like, Willy Wonka, you built up some value. If you really want to give it away, just sell it and enjoy your life. And it's the truth, kind of how everybody in the world would view a business. Like that's how I would view a business a billion times out of a billion and one. This one case being, oh, I never thought about that with a movie I've seen probably a dozen times. I never once wondered, how is Charlie going to run a factory? It's funny, as a non-comedian, I mean, you're delving into the world of being a comedian and you do, I don't know what you call it, an act or what do you call it as a comedian? Your act or your set. You know, on any particular one night, it's your set. But overall, you build more and more of your act, hopefully every day. As a non-comedian, it's funny. We're just letting these things pass over our heads. We're not being as observant of the day-to-day and the things that are right in our face. Yeah, and there are horrible things happening in the world. And comedy is not about ignoring them and being funny. Comedy is about paying attention to them and observing in ways that other people aren't. Like, I think this is a healthy outlook on how to view life. Like, take these shootings, these horrible shootings that happen, like, for instance, in El Paso. It's a disaster what's happening there. But then I noticed on the day of the El Paso police captain said, El Paso is the last place I would expect a shooting like this to occur. And I was thinking to myself, really? Because El Paso is probably at least in my top 10 cities where a shooting like this would occur. Because there's four times as many gun licenses in El Paso as New York City. Like, why would you not think that this could happen in El Paso? And just what he said strikes me as absurd. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with James to give a shout out to our show partner, Thrive Market. If you're in the USA and you want to start shopping online at Thrive, you've got to give it a go. And one of the things we love most about Thrive is that you can search under any category. And previously I've talked about that you can search under vegan, vegetarian, paleo, gluten-free, grain-free, but you can also search under terms like immunity. And since it's the season right now that people are getting sick or want to prevent getting sick, You can just search under immunity and you're going to find all kinds of immune supporting supplements, herbs, tinctures, teas, and things that you're just going to want to stock up on this time of year. So go ahead, start doing your search, start getting yourself equipped with some of the best supplements and products. And Thrive Market has all these products at 20 to 50% off of regular retail value, which is amazing. You're going to save so much money and save yourself a trip to the health food store. In addition, you're also going to get 25% off your order plus a 30-day free trial and free shipping. This is such an incredible deal for our listeners. And to take advantage, all you need to do is go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Go and put your first order in today with Thrive and take advantage of your amazing listener discount. And I would shout out from our other show partner, Beekeepers Naturals. First and foremost, I want to make sure that you've listened to episode 297 with Carly Stein, all about beekeepers, what their philosophy is, and their products. And after listening to this episode, you're definitely going to want to get your hands on Propolis, which is the perfect immune boosting spray, something that you're going to want to have on hand every day, this time of year, and all year round, because it just really soothes and coats your throat. It tastes really good. It's got antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, and lots of germ-fighting compounds. So get some propolis. We love taking it. It's something that we like to take before our interviews, and it's a wonderful, wonderful product, and they also have a kid's version as well. Propolis is a product that I love and love taking all the time, but I'm not taking it right now while I'm pregnant. So just something to keep in mind, but it is an amazing product. So go ahead and check out Propolis and learn all about beekeepers. As a listener of our show, you get 15% off the whole beekeepers lineup. And to take advantage, all you need to do is go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. On top of that, if you spend $60 or more, you get free shipping. The Propolis is great. Definitely get some of that. And another product I love is the Bee Elixir. And this is a natural nootropic, something I love taking before interviews. Before recording these ads, I took one as well, and it just really lights up the brain. So go and get yourself some Beekeepers products today. They are incredible. And now back to our chat with James. James. 
So let's get back to your comedy set or act and talk about how is that different for you? Because you're somebody who's doing different talks, you have a podcast of your own, and you're speaking with people. But as somebody who hasn't been on stage trying to deliver jokes, give us a little bit of insight into what that's like. You know, it's changes over time. Like I've been doing it for many years now. I say many, but there's a lot of professional comedians who have been doing it much longer, but for me, many. And at first I was terrified each time. And so part of that was I loved it. I loved the art form and I wanted to get better at it. I got obsessed with getting better at it. And people think, oh, I want to do things I love so I could be happy. I was not happy doing stand up comedy. I was obsessed with getting better at it. And I was extremely unhappy a large part of the time. I was unhappy right before I went up because I was terrified. You know how people are like, Jerry Seinfeld has the joke, more people are afraid of to speak in front of their peers than to die. So people are more afraid to give the eulogy at their own funeral than to actually have their own funeral. Comedy is 10 times worse than public speaking. So I was just terrified. Now I feel fear, but not terror. There's always fear. It's such a pleasure to build the different skills required to be good at comedy. And I'm really happy that I'm doing it. I've been a fan all my life. 25 years ago, I worked at HBO and, and I partly worked for HBO Comedy. I used to see stand-up comedy in the city all the time and I was always so afraid to go up on stage. So on the one hand, it was something I was a fan of. On the other hand, it was a challenge. And I always like, you know, challenges that are not really that dangerous are safe ways to practice for the challenges that are more dangerous or are scarier in life. So I knew it was a challenge for myself. So I did it and I loved it. And then I did it again and again, and I loved it. Then I did it again and I was horrible. I got heckled. It was miserable like the third or fourth time, but I wanted to get better at it. I said, I'm never going to do this again. But when I woke up in the morning, I said to myself, I have to do it again. It's like a challenge and it's something I've always loved. And what am I doing wrong? It seems like an interesting skill to get better at. And so I spent a lot of time trying to get better at that skill. I could definitely spend my time doing other things. For instance, I could spend certainly that time trying to make more money, or I could spend that time resting, or I could spend that time socializing. But instead, I spend that time brutalizing myself, trying to get better at a skill that I love. You mentioned fear. And other than just forcing yourself to get up there night after night and performing, what are some strategies you have for people when they have that fear, that resistance, and it's time to push through and, and get the job done? I think you said it in the question. You can't think your way to a solution. You know, if people are afraid or if they're procrastinating about something, you can't just say, well, it's better for me to think of a way out of this or think myself into confidence. You have to actually do things to be confident. When I work, I'll just use comedy as an example, but I can use business as an example. I could use health as an example. I could use minimalism as an example. But with comedy, I think to myself, oh, I'm thinking out loud. I'm thinking there's a joke. I write it down. I work on it a little bit. Just because I thought of a funny joke doesn't mean it's going to be funny. It doesn't mean I'm going to know how to perform it. I could only know that by doing it. And that's true for anything in life. I might think of a good business idea. You and I could say, oh, let's make Tinder for restaurants. We're just brainstorming on the fly. This is probably a bad idea. Let's say a restaurant is half empty and they have extra seats. They don't have any more reservations at night, but they're going to have extra food. They're willing to give discounts to anybody who just shows up right then. So they throw it on the Tinder for restaurants. Everybody in the area is just swiping past all the restaurants and deals that they might get. And who knows? Maybe that's an app idea that may be good, might be bad. I won't know until I actually do it or test it in some way. I won't know if anybody at all will care about this idea. Maybe restaurants won't care about it. Maybe the humans won't care about it. But I won't know until I do it. And this ties into something we got into on the first time we chatted, which is generating ideas. And I know a big thing for you is having a practice each and every day where you're taking a notepad, actually a restaurant notepad, and writing down, I think it's 10 ideas a day. And just over time, you're just putting ideas out and working on this muscle. So talk about why that's so important for you. You know, when we talk about health, we usually talk about improvement. Because what's health 
without some sense of improvement. Let's say you're in the gym and you lift the same, I'm going to make it up like 20 pound weights every day and you do the same amount of reps. Is that healthy? I don't know. At some point that could turn into be harmful because you get too used to those weights. Your muscles stop building and you're just kind of hurting yourself or tearing muscle for no reason. So it's the same thing with creativity. Same thing with almost every thing worth doing, but let's just isolate creativity. Creativity is a muscle and it needs to be exercised. And I'll ask you, let's say you're sick and in bed. How long would it take for you to be in bed nonstop? Let's say you were in a bike accident and you're in bed nonstop in the hospital for two weeks. If you just get up and start walking, will you have trouble walking? Most definitely. Why? Because muscles are going to atrophy over time and we're not using our bodies. Right. So if you're not creative, let's say you're going to a nine to five job and or for any reason, let's say you're not creative for two weeks, same thing. And then you decide, oh, well, creativity is more about inspiration. It's when lightning hits. No, if your creativity muscles aren't exercised and bulked up, you're not going to be creative. Your creative muscles will atrophy. And so part of the reason of writing 10 ideas a day or writing every day or doing something creative every day, I like to simplify it and say writing 10 ideas a day. If you do that every single day, you will be a creativity machine within three months. It'll be like a superpower within six months. You'll be able to look at anything and come up with ideas. You won't come up with good ideas because who comes up with good ideas all the time? Nobody. But you know, if you write 10 ideas a day, that's 3,650 ideas a year. One idea might be brilliant. 10 ideas might be pretty good. But if you write no ideas, you're going to have no ideas. And then people say ideas are a dime a dozen, executions, everything. That is just so wrong because good ideas are not a dime a dozen. It's really hard to come up with good ideas. Execution, I could give 10 people the same idea and say, okay, go execute on this. And they're all going to execute in different ways. One person will execute so poorly, the idea will never get off the ground. But one person might execute, and within a day, this person will know, oh, this is a huge idea, or this is a bad idea. Execution ideas are just a subset of ideas. You can't execute without being good at coming up with ideas. So I guess coming back to your point just there, even if an idea turns out to be a failure, it might not be the idea. It might just be the execution. Right. So I had this conversation last night. A friend of mine had a, what seemed like a pretty good idea for a business. And she was telling me, okay, well, I've got to build the app. I really want to build the app and then see if people sign up, blah, blah, blah. And I said, why do you need to build the app? And she said, well, how else is it going to work? And I said, well, why don't you manually collect the information you need and then send emails out to all your friends and see if they want that information. And if they do, then build the app to automatically collect the information and automatically have your friends sign up. But if your friends don't even like your emails, they don't share your emails with their friends, they are not excited about the information you're providing, it's probably a bad idea. You could test this idea out in one day instead of spending $40,000 getting ripped off buying the app somewhere, and you could save yourself six months of time and a lot of aggravation. So I just gave you two execution methods. They will both come up with the same result in terms of determining if the idea is good or not, but one saved you six months. So James, you have a lot going on. You do have your podcast, your writing, you're doing the comedy. How do you go about keeping your life organized? Do you have to-do lists or apps on your phone or what does that look like? I don't have to-do lists because I sort of feel like there's very few things that are actually really important to me to do. I write every day. That's important to me. Spending time with family is important to me. Doing, now that I'm interested in this stand-up comedy, that's important to me. My businesses that I'm involved with are important to me, but I try to keep that in balance because the way I learn things to be successfully involved in business, I learn that outside the context of business. So you have to live life to know what your businesses will need, whether you're an investor or coming up with a business or whatever. So I don't really keep to-do lists because at any given moment, the next thing I'm doing is one of the three or four things that are important to me. Unless I do keep a calendar which I guess you can argue is kind of a to-do list. But I know, for instance, at two o'clock today, we had podcast scheduled. So I'm available for this podcast. And I do a podcast. I know what it's like to do a podcast. I like to help other people do podcasts. And if it's in the afternoon, which this is for me right now, I often agree to do podcasts. 
And what about self-care? Is this something you're putting in your calendar and doing on a regular basis? Or how do you make sure you're keeping balance in your day-to-day? Well, what do you mean by self-care? Say, taking time to go for a walk or making sure you're drinking enough water or taking time to read a book just for fun and not specifically for business. Right. So I almost don't consider that self-care because that sounds like something different than I would normally do. Oh, now it's time for my self-care time. So instead of eating like an apricot Danish, I'm going to drink a green smoothie. I sort of think self-care is just a part of life. And as you get older, your needs change. And so you have to adapt. And I try not to eat anything unhealthy for me. I try to sleep eight hours a day. I try to surround myself with people that are good for me and I'm good for them and they don't stress me out. There's no need to be around people who stress you out. And I try to be creative every day because that's part of self-care. It's like I said, it's a muscle. I don't like the word spiritual, but I try to not regret the past or be anxious about the future. So that allows me to be more calm in the now, to use a cliched phrase. I think that's self-care. And then I try to do the things I love doing. And I think that's self-care. Any tricks that you have for staying in the present moment? Yeah, this is the thing about meditation. And I'm not going to recommend meditation here, but I think a lot of people have a different definition of meditation. Everybody you talk to has a different definition. It's like, oh, it's something you do to get enlightenment. Or I've heard people say it's something you do to get extra powers or insight. Or it's something you do to feel more relaxed or it's something you have a mantra to have higher states of being. I don't think meditation is any of those things. I think all meditation is, you catch yourself having thoughts of regret or anxiety about the future or the past. And once you catch yourself, you bring yourself back to the center. Like, I mean, you say it very quickly, but you say, oh, I'm back on that train of dwelling about the past or anxiety about the future or thinking about what that person said to me or thinking about how I'm upset about this situation or my boss or my friend or whatever. So then you catch yourself and you go back to just breathing. And then a few minutes later, you catch yourself again and you go back to just breathing. So meditation is often called a practice. People say, what's your practice? What kind of practice do you do? Well, they never stop to ask, what's it practice for? It's practice for the other 23 or 23 and a half hours a day where you actually are living life and thinking and dwelling and regretting, and being anxious, and being fearful, and overthinking things, so that later when you're not meditating, you can say to yourself, oh, I don't really need to regret this right now. I need to just focus on right now. Meditation is one way to practice stopping yourself from going down those trains of thought that seem to last for hours sometimes, or days, or you're driving your car, and suddenly you realize you're at your destination. You can't remember any part of the trip because you were dwelling and you were anxious and you were regretting and you were angry. You know, sometimes it's good to just to catch yourself and enjoy the drive, whether it's meditation or some other way you practice. This is a good idea to practice as often as possible, noticing your thoughts, distancing yourself a little from them because you're going to think no matter what, it's almost like it's this movie that's playing on the screen of your head and you're just an observer of the movie. You aren't the movie but you're an observer of the movie, but sometimes it's so engaging and we love these trains of thought so much, we identify with them. But I think making sure you keep a healthy distance from them as much as you possibly can, it's impossible to do it all the time. That's how you kind of practice staying in the moment. You can't be disappointed when, oh my gosh, I've just spent the past two hours thinking about that email she wrote me or he wrote me or my boss did or whatever. Ultimately, none of it's important, but That's a cliche to say, oh, you know, we're all going to die eventually. None of it's important. But what really isn't important is thinking about it. Because again, thinking will never be a solution. So think about when we were, let's call it cavemen. You're walking past a bush and suddenly you hear this rustling noise. You start running. And then afterwards, you might say to yourself, why did I start running? Well, I was afraid a tiger or a lion was there. And that's why I took off. Okay, that's a great rationalization. But notice the thinking occurred after the running. You didn't stop for a second right next to the bush and say, hmm, what is that rustling? It might be the wind or it might be a lion. And if it's the lion, I should run. And then you start running. No, we have fight or flight. We run first and then we have emotions along the way. And then we think 
thinking is the final thing. And that's how it happened from an evolutionary perspective. Our brain was the last part of our bodies to evolve. And it's the same thing with, you know, actions precede thinking, not the other way around. But in our society now, we're so used to just sitting around and staring at a screen and staring at the phone. We think that thinking solves our problems and then we take action. But that's not true at all. First, you have to take action and then you can analyze it and think, did I do the right thing? I mean, there might be a little thinking. That's why there's a reason why we evolved the brain, but there might, so there might be a little bit of thinking, but I think we overdo it. A big part of self-care is to avoid that overthinking. And that seems like I'm talking about intelligence or mental stuff, but the reality is stress is related to inflammation in the body, is related to diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all these horrible diseases. So, and stress comes from thinking too much. But do you ever think that thinking might be a good thing at times? You mentioned that we're staring at these screens, staring at our phones, and we're almost in this 21st century stimulation mode all the time these days where there's always something to do, something to look at, and we're never really bored like we would have been, say, 20 years ago. So it's interesting because back again, say 20 years ago, there would have been time just to think and just to sit on the couch and be bored. So how important do you find that would be? You're right. I think the phone has become this great thing to occupy us and make sure we're not bored, but maybe there's better ways to do it. Who knows? How do you keep your phone usage in check and your use of social media? I can't say I'm totally phone free. I'm guilty of this as well. But I think it's a useful exercise just to say, look, I just spent an hour on the phone. Am I happier that I did that or not so happy that I did that? And do you have like set periods of time where you'll shut your phone off or put it in another room? No, I mean, I've tried it all. Like I've tried, for instance, never bring my phone outdoors. Like I would always just leave it in the home. So if when I'm going outside, I would leave my phone at home. I've tried that, but I'm in the middle of something and I need to hear news. So I need to have the phone with me, but I do other things. Like I don't read a newspaper that's off limits for me. I haven't read a newspaper probably since 2010. Okay. And why not? Just because why everyone says, Oh, you're not going to be informed. That's actually total bullshit. Like I've been in the newspaper business at different times in my distant past. And a newspaper will certainly not make you more informed about the world. A newspaper is a hundred percent so-called fake news. And I'd rather read a book. A book will keep me more informed than a newspaper on any day of the week. Do you watch the news? No, I never watch the news. Like on local TV or something or CNN? Yeah, yeah. CNN or... No, no, because there's so much funner to watch other things. James, on your blog, you talk about not going to the doctor and you actually say that you haven't been for a checkup since age 16. So why is this? I would like to be able to say because I've never been sick, which is true. I mean, I've had colds and stuff, but I've never actually been seriously ill, fortunately. But at the same time, some people have told me that maybe I'm a hypochondriac and that's why I've never been to the doctor. Do you go to any natural alternative type practitioners like naturopathic doctor, massage, anything like that? No. I mean, what do you do? You're a healthy guy. What do you do? At this moment? I work with functional medicine doctors. So what's that mean? It's kind of like a conventional doctor, but they go for the root cause of what's happening. So conventional doctors tend to sway more towards surgery, medications, and functional medicine practitioners tend to do certain tests and get to the root of why you're having symptoms. Okay. And why do you think conventional doctors don't do the trick? I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe it comes back to the training. And I'm sure there are some conventional doctors that are doing a great job, but I would say a lot of it must come down to the training. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, probably conventional doctors aren't as bad as people always think. They certainly have gotten good training for a lot of serious diseases like, I don't know, cancer or whatever. Well, diagnosing for sure and treating emergencies, definitely. Although arguably they make a lot of mistakes too. So you have to be careful they're not making mistakes. I've done a lot of research on how often doctors make mistakes and it's quite often. Yeah, so at this point then your contact with the medical establishment is very minimal. Yeah, I see a therapist, I do that. Well, James, you talk about how your dad was your first mentor. So how so? 
I think for most people, their parents are probably a good first mentor to have. And my dad, most importantly, he wasn't always the most there father, but he taught me to be honest. And I think that's a really important quality. When you lie, even a white lie, you can argue white lie is not a big deal. And maybe you'd be correct in many cases, but it starts to add up. Like every lie makes you live a double life. There's the life of the people who know the truth. And there's the life of the people who know the lie. In my experience, it's hard enough to live one life well, let alone a double life. That seems to me to be extremely hard. So I think that was an important thing I learned from my dad. And I also learned not necessarily work hard and you'll be happy, but he did teach me a little bit about having a good work ethic and not to expect anything. I never expected any advantage from him. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with James to give a shout out to our show partner, Four Sigmatic. And keeping on our theme of immune boosting foods, medicinal mushrooms are definitely part of that. And Four Sigmatic is stocked full of different kinds of mushrooms. And one area I want to point out on their website that you want to check out is under blends. They have a whole bunch of different kinds of mushroom blends that have multiple herbs in them. And one of the ones that I love taking when I'm not pregnant is the adaptogen blend. It's got reishi, cordyceps, ginseng, ashwagandha, tulsi, gynostemma, so many beautiful adaptogenic herbs. They are so good for your immune system, so good to adapt to stress, a great pick-me-up in the middle of the day. So you want to check out some of these blends. There's different ones. And yeah, if you are pregnant, you may just want to be cautious because there's some herbs in there that you just want to be, you know, wary of while you're going through this phase of life. But otherwise, they are amazing. This is something that you want to keep on hand. So go ahead and check out the different blends from Forest Sigmatic. You won't be disappointed. And you definitely won't be disappointed by the fact that you get 15% off your Four Sigmatic purchases. And to take advantage, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Four Sigmatic. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Four Sigmatic. And Four Sigmatic is spelled F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C. In addition, if you spend $100 or more, you get free shipping. Go and take advantage of your Four Sigmatic discount today. They have all the shrooms you can handle. And now a shout out from another show partner, Organifi. And another product you can add to the arsenal of immune boosting supplements is Organifi's Immunity. This is a drink that has simple immune boosting superfoods and it can help fight the symptoms of cold and flu and also the duration. And their formula combines nutrients you already know, things like zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, and it actually tastes really good. It's also got some other beautiful products in there like acerola cherry, and it's sweetened with monk fruit. It tastes really good, and you can just put it in your water. Or when you get on the plane, it's a great thing to add to your reusable water bottle, and it's something you can sip on while you're on a flight to keep your immune system strong. So if you haven't tried the immunity yet, get your hands on it. They come in single-serve packets that are great to bring with you on the go. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off the whole Organifi lineup by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Go and get yourself some of the immunity product today and add it to your immune boosting toolkit. And now back to our chat with James. You talk about having a good work ethic. As somebody yourself achieved a lot of different successes in their life, how do you continue to keep that hunger, that grind, even after you've reached, I know you've had financial success at different times, you've made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, and this has happened to you a number of times, but you're a successful guy. And even before this interview, you're writing and you're disciplined as far as I know and, and can tell from the outside. So how do you keep that hunger even after reaching success? What's the reason you were aiming for success? What is success? I would say a lot of what we call success is not about money, but it's about doing things we love and being happy doing those things and being good at those things. I really appreciate when money's not the reason why I do something. For instance, some people, they say their goal is to make a billion dollars. Well, I always ask them, what would you do with a billion dollars? If you try that, if you ask someone that, they never really have a good reason about what they would do with a billion dollars. Now, some people have a passion for making money. 
and it feels good to them to come up with ideas that make more and more money. So they should do it. They should try to make a billion dollars because they love it. I don't necessarily love it. I shouldn't say unfortunately, but for better or for worse, I enjoy things that don't make a lot of money. So I need to make money to, of course, solve my money problems and not be worried about money. And everybody has a different number about the lifestyle they want to lead. And plus you have kids, spouses, parents, family, responsibilities. But a lot of the things I do don't make me any money at all. Like I'll tell you, owning a comedy club is a horrible investment. I do have a work ethic to do the things I love doing because I always think improvement gives me pleasure. Not perfection, but progress is pleasurable and not necessarily improvement. Well, this reminds me of the banner on your website right now where you say, will you be 1% better today? So why 1%? Why is that the number you go with? It's arbitrary, but everybody says, well, that's just 365% better in a year. And I'm always amazed when people say that because basic math that you learn in school is that things compound. So a 1% compounded is a lot better than 365%. It's actually almost 3,800%. And that's amazing to have that kind of return on any investment. So if you're investing in improving yourself, you're going to really succeed in life. Anything you try to get better at, you're going to be 3,800% better in a year. Well, James, in your book, Reinvent Yourself, you talk about finding well-being by working on three specific areas, one being freedom, relationships being another, and competence being another. So I want to take a few minutes here and dive into each of these and talk about why specifically here in the beginning, freedom is so important. Well, it depends again on how you define freedom. I think freedom is freedom from all those regrets and anxieties that we talked about earlier. Freedom is you're healthy physically. If you're sick in bed, you're not as free as you could be. Freedom emotionally is important so that you're not tied to arguing with people around you. You try to put yourself in situations. You can't completely eliminate being around people who are unhealthy for you. Freedom is having the ability to keep improving that 1% a day. Freedom is being creative so that if you have a problem, you know your creativity freedom will kick in and help you solve that problem. And freedom spiritually so that you know that, oh, I shouldn't try to control things I can't control, feeling like I have to be able to control that. And your second one, relationships, is pretty self-evident why that contributes to well-being. But on a daily basis, what is something we can do to chip away at maintaining that pillar? Nobody has it really easy. And I think being good at relationships is a difficult thing. It's just a matter of experience. Like, Who do you enjoy spending time with? Why do you enjoy spending time with them? Competence, as an outsider looking in on you, I'm guessing this comes from things like reading books, listening to podcasts, audiobooks, but correct me if I'm wrong. I like to just sit around and do nothing. I consider myself a pretty lazy person. So the one great thing is about self-care is that you never want to take time from the things you love to do more of the things you hate. So sometimes people say, I got to do X, Y, and Z before I could sit down and do A, B, and C. Because X, Y, and Z is my job. We all have these responsibilities. I have responsibilities. I have to go on a trip next month that's for business. I don't really want to go, but try to minimize those as much as possible. And for me, that's really important. In general, I find out that I'm a lazy person, which sounds kind of odd given what we've just talked about. But I really like to just rest and relax spend time doing nothing. You need to have time to think or you need to have time to rest in order to rejuvenate so you can be more creative, so you could be healthy. And when you're resting, it means you're probably not arguing with people. So resting is like really critical. Having that boredom time I talked about earlier. Totally. I think that's a critical part of self-care. And, and people say, well, I'll rest when I make that billion or make that 10 million or when I get that promotion or I get my PhD, I'll finally be able to rest. You could certainly block out some time to rest today. Keep track of what you do during the day. Oh, by the way, the average person in the US spends three hours a day on social media. And you could say to yourself, well, not me. I don't do that. Well, keep track. Do you spend three hours or do you spend one hour? If you didn't spend that one hour on social media, maybe you could cut it in half, spend only a half hour. Now you could spend a half hour taking a walk around the block, looking at the rooftops and just relaxing a little bit, rejuvenating. Did you really need to spend that extra half hour or hour or two hours? on social media? Did you really need to have 
that business call that resulted in nothing? Did you really need to make that business trip? I've hardly ever gone on a business trip where I actually made money because of the business trip. I would argue all my best business trips were just down the block rather than across the country. Kind of riffing off this here, part of creating time for ourselves is to have our goals straight and then working back from there to figure out how much money we need to make to live the lifestyle we want to live. Because I'm sure you've experienced this as you start getting more and more success, different opportunities open up and it can be the constant dopamine hit, having all these different accomplishments and wanting to strive for more and more and more when maybe the answer for you is to work a certain amount, make a certain amount of money, live a certain lifestyle and create that freedom to go for a walk or to slow down and create that balance in your life. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I would argue I had much more freedom before I made a dime. So when I was in my 20s, man, it was so great. I worked hard at my job. I did a great job. I loved my job. And then at night, I lived in Astoria, Queens, and I went to this pool hall, and all these people were sitting around playing chess and backgammon and drinking coffee and laughing and talking. And I suddenly found this place right next to my apartment, and I would just go there every night and spend four or five hours hanging out with these people. And it was so much fun. It was relaxing. I didn't think about work. I wasn't dying to have a girlfriend at that point. And I don't say I miss that time because times come and go, but that was a really nice thing before I even once thought about money. And even to get that job, I turned down another job that offered twice the salary, but I knew it would be harder and less interesting work. And double the salary would have made a big difference for me. This was like my first serious adult job. So One company offered me 40,000 a year. Another company offered me 80,000 a year. And that was the difference, let's say, between living in the worst apartment in Astoria, Queens, against living in a decent apartment in Manhattan at the time. And I chose the route I thought would make me happier, and it did. And so I always try to not recreate that moment, but just be aware that those are the moments that I truly remember, not going from 40,000 a year to 42,500 a year to whatever the next one was, money never really made much of a difference, except when I made a lot of money. And then when I lost a lot of money, I felt horrible. And when I made a lot of money, it felt good because I knew I would be able to take care of my kids for the rest of my life. That was the reason money was important to me. Right. Well, I think you might be solidifying my point just in a different way where I'm saying once we have a certain amount of money and we can live the lifestyle we want to live, and support our family, then maybe it's time to not continue to propel for constant growth and another book deal and another speaking gig where you got to fly across the country or it's kind of reverse engineering. Here's the lifestyle I want to live. And this is the amount of money I need to live that way comfortably. Yeah, I agree. But I think you could do that even in the quest for money. So like right now, I spend some time on making money and I probably work harder at it than when I had a regular job, but I do it much more efficiently. So I'm able to put much less time in and potentially or hopefully make more money. Over time, you learn to be super efficient with how to make money. So sometimes it requires a little bit of extra time for me, but other times I can binge watch my favorite TV show and read a book and then go out at night and listen to stand-up comedy. Now, I would certainly make more money if I didn't do all that stuff, possibly, but I just love doing these things, so I don't let money get in the way. But then I have to efficiently figure out how am I going to make money then, and that forces you to be as efficient as possible in how you make money. Are you happy? I don't know what that means. Like happy, again, like I was describing with stand-up comedy. I'm going to do stand-up comedy twice tonight. I have two different performances tonight. Before I go on, I can guarantee you for the two hours before I go on each show, I'm going to be terrified. Will I be happy being terrified? Probably not. Will I be stressed? Maybe a little. I'll have to deal with that then. And will I be thinking and thinking, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? What if the crowd does this? What if the crowd does that? What if it's this kind of crowd? What if the joke bombs? So yeah, at some moments, I'm happy. Happiness is ebbs and flows. Yeah. And it's like when neurochemicals, when dopamine fires off, you feel happy, but dopamine gets absorbed into the body. It gets metabolized by the body within seconds. And then you need the next hit of dopamine to feel happy. But I will say in general, I'm satisfied. I do think for myself right now, I'm probably working a little too hard, meaning 
I probably have too many things going on in my life and it's not making me as in general as satisfied as I think I could be. And I'm trying to figure out what things to start to slow down on so I could, again, focus more on the things I really love doing. But I don't know. I think the key is more to always focus on what you're doing right now and how you can make it the best possible situation for yourself. James, in wrapping up, what does ultimate health mean to you? Ultimate health means to me, physically, I'm at the best point that I could be for me right now. Emotionally, I'm at the best point I could be for myself right now. And then creatively, I keep working on my creativity every day and I'm exercising that muscle. Spiritually, I surrender to the things I can't control. I don't always have these four aspects of health. Sometimes I try to control things I can't control. Sometimes I'm upset at people. Sometimes I'm not as creative as I'd like to be. Sometimes I wish I was a little physically healthier in various ways, although I feel pretty good in general. Like I said, I haven't been to a doctor forever. And I think that's health plus the idea that I'm trying to improve on all of those things every day, even as I grow older. So some things are going to naturally decline, but am I doing the best to improve each day? And am I being honest with myself about that? Sometimes I'm not improving every day, but I try to. That's what's important. And James, how can the listeners connect with you after the show? Just Google my name, James Altucher. I have a fun podcast where I talk about a lot of these issues with people and I write every day or I try to write as much as possible. You can sign up or you could read my blog at jamesaltucher.com. I have a lot of books, but there's one book that I encourage people to read called Choose Yourself. And I always like talking about these issues. So I'm really grateful I'm here on the Ultimate Health Podcast talking about them. Well, I had a lot of fun chatting with you, James, and thanks for coming back on the show. We're going to link everything up in the show notes, and I hope we can do this again someday. Yeah, definitely. Invite me on anytime. I appreciate it. Okay, have a great day and good luck tonight. Okay, thanks a lot. You too. Bye. Take care. We hope you enjoyed today's episode with James. He is always full of great information. And we not only want to make sure that you're subscribed to the show, but we want to make sure that you're sharing our episodes with people in your life. If you know someone who can benefit from this episode or a show in general, please share it to a colleague, family, friend, anybody. Let's keep spreading the message of Ultimate Health. And also let us know what you think over on Instagram. Give us a shout out on your stories. Be sure to tag Ultimate Health Podcast and at Altcher. Let us know what you thought of today's episode. We can't wait to see it. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 312. We have links there to everything we discussed, a show summary, and a downloadable worksheet. So check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, we really appreciate all you do. Thank you. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he's been making some new audio equipment that he's enjoying and looks forward to using it on our podcast. I'm super excited about this. I know we have great sound now, but I want to keep improving it, evolving. And Jace, super happy that you're committed to continuing to make us sound better. Have an awesome week. Talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.